The Black Doctors Podcast highlights the stories of minority professionals with the goal of inspiring others. Season 2 provides more episodes and features a wider variety of professions. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and share with others, because the next generation can't be what they don't see. Tune in every Monday to hear our stories told by us. Hey everybody, and welcome back to the Black Doctors Podcast. Today I'm privileged to be speaking with Dr. Italo Brown. He's an emergency medicine physician, but even more than that, he finished undergraduate school at uh, Morehouse. He attended the Harry for medical school, and he earned his MPH from Boston University. That was before he even applied to go into to the field of medicine. He's extremely well accomplished. He's a fantastic speaker and writer. Dr. Brown, thank you so much for joining us on the show. And Stephen, I'm happy to be here, dude. You guys are, are incredible, and I think that this is going to land so well among our students who are looking for uh, insight on how to approach the field. Awesome. I certainly hope so. So in that regard, Dr. Brown, tell us a little bit about your job as an attending emergency medicine physician. It's interesting, right? So the emergency department is thought of as kind of like an access point to the healthcare system. And a lot of folks who come to the ER are either presenting on their worst days or because it's the last resort. And, and our job usually is to not only address any medical issue that comes through the door, whether it be like a general complaint or a chronic issue that's unaddressed, um, and an actual emergency from a trauma of some sort, and sometimes things as simple as just not having a meal or not having a place to sleep. So we really do the full spectrum of care and try to link people with resources as well as discern who is, you know, critically ill and needs admission or who um, is safe to go home with follow-up. Yeah, but you guys, uh, as I did my one month of emergency medicine as an intern, and and geez, man, the OR was so busy. <laughs> I think what I picture in my head is just chaos all the time, but how is it for you? What's a typical day like? Well, it depends on the setting. So I'll start off by saying that I am at a level one trauma center. And so you do get some of the chaos from uh, major traumatic events that happen. Uh, a typical day for me, though, would be something like, you know, come in as long as it's kind of calm, no no uh, immediate notification coming through the doors. You get a sign out from uh, a doctor that's been there overnight. They tell you about the patients that are still being worked up. Uh, and then you can get any type of complaint like chest pain, belly pain, shortness of breath. Right now we're in COVID, uh, and so a lot of the cases are rule out COVID cases. Mm -hmm. But um, I get motor vehicle collisions, stab wounds, gunshots, uh, freak accidents like falls from uh, a ladder or trying to repair something on a roof. Uh, you get a lot of of household casual incidents like somebody cleaning a glass and it breaks and then uh, lacerates their their palm or something like that as well as you do get some of the, the some of the things that I'm not happy to see like abuse cases mm. uh, so the, all of those things are are littered throughout the day and it comes in any random assortment which makes the field interesting because you can walk through the doors and really say like I have to prepare myself for any particular case and be able to respond. Tell us a little bit about the schedule, because I know it's a, a big draw for a lot of people going to emergency medicine, is that the schedules are flexible. I know some places do eight-hour shifts, some are 10, some are 12, so many yeah. a month. How does that uh, kind of factor into your work life? And, and you kind of choose that, if I'm not, not wrong. Correct. Yeah, so, I mean, all of these things are almost like an a la carte set up in, in my opinion. You you have 12-hour shifts, 10-hour shifts, and 8-hour shifts, uh, depending on the institution and the site and how much overlap coverage they have. But basically, you know, you, you look at what your lifestyle is going to be. You look at the uh, minimum amount of hours that are required to, to fulfill a month, right? So mm -hmm. uh, the way that I've approached it is, I, I mean, I work 8 hours, 8-hour uh, shifts. We don't have coverage, like double coverage anything like that eight hours doesn't have an overlap is me and my team. Uh, the other part about mm -hmm. it is that um, I only work um, between 12 to 14 shifts a month. So that's a little on the higher side because I'm still 
uh, within the, the beginning parts of my career where I still have the energy to, to do shifts. But I've seen, you know, people work as few shifts as like four or six a month. And I've seen as many as something like 18, 19 a month for attendings. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I will say that the biggest concern in emergency medicine is usually physician burnout. And so you, we are taught early on to think about our wellness and uh, trying to value things that really make our lifestyle um, livable and rewarding. And so part of that for me is working an appropriate amount of hours, working the, the amount of shifts that I think I can still have a, a very enjoyable life at the same time. Yeah, that's that's huge. And you are an academic attending. You're at a level one trauma center. It's also an academic medical center. That's right. Now, how, how does the job change if you were, say, at an urgent care or community hospital? And like, what do those options look like for emergency medicine physicians? Yeah, so, so for the listeners, essentially, the difference between academic institutions and community sites, the difference is that at an academic institution, you usually have a teaching hospital set up. That means there's residents there. You have consult services that also have that are resident run and have attendings that are either in-house or very close. And that, that gives you a, a different breadth of or spectrum of medical issues that you can address. In the community, it's usually uh, a lot more streamlined. So the, the consult services uh, are not as robust. And there usually aren't residents. Some of them have some residents that rotate through, but it's usually just the attending, maybe a couple providers like a, a PA, and then you see all the patients and you make the consults and things that can be addressed through your, um, your, your array of skill sets you do. And things that can't, mm -hmm. you either transfer the patient out to a, a site that has those services or you can consult the service to come in. But with that said, People love both environments for various reasons. I think the reason why people usually choose academic sites is because they love to teach and they think about the idea of constantly being immersed in um, the evidence and the evidence-based practice and kind of being cutting edge. And the reason why people choose yeah. community is often a level of control and wanting to have more hands-on ability, particularly because those skill sets that you learn as a resident, you can apply them readily in the community on a day-to-day -day basis. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Not to beat a dead horse, but, but I know, especially with COVID-19 and however the resident application system is going to go this mm -hmm. year, I think this is, this is extremely valuable for people to, to listen to. Something I learned about emergency medicine is that you guys are the medical control for emergency medical services, EMS. That's facts. Yeah, how does that work out? So... I mean, it's actually a, a, an entire fellowship and a specialty out of emergency medicine. You can be fellowship trained in EMS. And we often have a, a portion of our experience as residents is working with EMS and going to those control sites. But basically what it is, is uh, a lot of these EMS, uh, for these first responders will arrive to the scene of, of some type of an incident. And they have to do a quick assessment to determine, like, the severity of the illness and where to appropriately drive that patient, right? So if you have a person, you pull up to a scene and you're like, all right, this is a, a very significant injury from a motor vehicle collision, it wouldn't make sense to take this person to, like, a, a tertiary care center. You want to take them to a level one center. But when it's not that clear-cut and dry, they need to contact somebody and someone who has enough knowledge to make that call uh, while they're in the field. And that's where your EM providers come in. So there's a number of times where even at my hospital currently, we'll get a ring down, uh, and that's the appropriate term for when an EMS center contacts a, a kind of like a control center. We'll get a ring down, and mm -hmm. they'll say, you know, is this appropriate to come to this hospital, or should I go to a different hospital? A lot of times this is around, like, pediatric traumas, right? So if you don't have inpatient gotcha. uh, folks who can handle a, a child that has had a traumatic event occur to them, then they may be ill-equipped and potentially put that child in danger. So we'll get these calls, and, and that's one of the things that we do. Another one is like when you think about ingestions, like toxic ingestions, whether it's an overdose or whether this person took like 
you know, 90 pills of, of a beta blocker or something like that. You want to know, are you taking them to the right place where they can address this issue? So uh, EM providers do kind of wear multiple hats. And this is one of the things that we, we specialize in the ability to kind of make these snap judgments with a high degree of uh, efficiency or high degree of accuracy. You know, um, Rich Benson. Yeah, yeah, man. So (laughs) funny story, Richard and I, we both went to the same (laughs) schools twice, right? So he's a Morehouse grad. I think he's 09 Morehouse grad. And then he's also a Meharry grad because we both have locks. You know, Mm -hmm. we're almost always brought up in the same conversation. They're like, oh, do you know Italo? Yeah. Or if he's me, do you know Rich? I'd be like, yeah, I know Rich. And then we both went into emergency medicine. (laughs) So it's just like, yeah, you know, one after another. But yeah. shout out to that brother. And I, I know he, yeah, he did the uh, he did an EMS fellowship out in North Carolina. Uh, I, w- I trained with him at. That's right. That's right. Yeah, we worked together at University of Chicago. And man, I mean, Rich was the OG in the emergency department. That dude um, got mad at some pickles, man. He, he's he's a good that's guy. Facts, facts, and he's very intelligent. And I think that that just like goes to show you how versatile they can be. Uh, he's a good dude. Speaking of Morehouse and Meharry, let's let's uh, take it back because you went to Morehouse for undergrad. What did you study, and how was your experience at Morehouse? Man, so uh, Morehouse is 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 a gem of an institution. It's it is what I would consider one of the the few remaining uh, places where uh, students can get a completely immersive cultural experience while getting a high caliber education. Now. Uh, I don't just say that because I'm a product of Morehouse, but I say that because of the current climate around uh, society and how valuable it is to have things like this supported. With that said, man, Morehouse was amazing. Coming from California where, and, and not having any biological brothers, uh, I knew that I needed to be in a place that would uh, nurture my desire to grow as a, a, a young Black mm-hmm. man and and put me in a place where the competition was not toxic, but rather uh, empowering. And that's kind of what Morehouse presented. You know, from day one, you, you step on a campus and you like hear about all of these uh, legendary folks who have done powerful things for our people in, in society. And then they tell you that there's a crown that's over your head that you have to like work your tail off to grow into. And so hearing that wow. at 17 years old, it just changes the way that you view the world. And then also being in a place where like, oh, you know, you're among a bunch of folks who were valedictorians in their high school. They were, they're also like descendants of royalty in other countries or you, uh, they, they come from uh, little to nothing and are extremely intelligent and they're all in the same room. And, and you sitting there talking about who could play spades. You know, and sitting there talking about like, like who's really nice playing basketball. And so to have yeah. that degree of, uh, of camaraderie was important for me. Um, but my time there wasn't without challenge. I'm not going to even lie. You know, I wasn't the best student for a number of years and I, I hit many, many hurdles in that process. It took a long time for me to find myself and to find my identity as a scholar. And I can't say that would have happened without the support of the instructors that were at Morehouse who never gave up on me. Wow. So you came from California to Atlanta. Facts. When you arrived on the campus of Morehouse, did you have your polo shirts buttoned all the way up to you? Man, head? so no. <laughs> so so here's the <laughs> thing, right? This is this is exactly what I remember. Cause in that time, like we're talking about, this is two thousand and two Italo. So this is right before Jay Z really pushed everybody to wear button downs and Kanye pushed everybody mm-hmm. to wear uh polos. So I'm coming out. I got jerseys, you know, I got, I had the jerseys, okay. I had the throwbacks. Uh, but in California, you know, we were, we're very much uh, uh, a Chucks and, 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 and denim type of culture. We have uh, a color right. restrictions. So I had never worn red. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you want me to wear this maroon mm-hmm. shirt? I'm like, where I come from, this is Pyru almost. So I don't wear these Whoa. colors. <laughs> so I was sticking to my neutrals. Uh, that was funny. <laughs> I was sticking, I had a, my wardrobe was was extremely neutral, <laughs> so earth tones and neutrals, man. So I got used to. I started finding and pushing the boundaries of what colors I could wear because I wasn't worried about oh, uh, uh, any set getting upset, right? And then 
I just remember music was different. You hear first time I started hearing about booty bass and like Florida music and then dip mm-hmm. diplomats and dip set and all this up north stuff. And then for me, I was listening to high fume music because I'm from Northern California. All our stuff was E40, uh, Keek to Sneak, uh, Federation. Like, so it just was this melting pot of different uh, regional cultures and subcultures. Yeah. Well, I mean, that speaks to the power of one college and then uh, HBCUs especially, man. They, they just grow you so much. That's a fact. Um, you went from Morehouse to Boston University where you earned your MPH. What inspired you or led you to, to get that degree? Man, uh, I gotta be, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge that my junior year at Morehouse, I had a class and this was a public health course and the guy's name was Dr. Bill Jenkins. He, if, if anybody's listening, Google that man. Uh, he recently passed, like I think in, within the last year. But he was one of the pivotal feature figures in exposing the Tuskegee studies and, the, and how long they were. Really? So as a junior, I'm in this class called epidemiology. And he gives us this introductory lecture about how cholera actually came about. And, and he discusses how there was this you know, a community that lived downstream from this well. And the, um, the person realized the community that lived downstream had more disease than the people who lived upstream. And he tracked it back to this one well and this pump handle. It, he, he went to the pump handle and knocked it off because he realized that this was what was causing it because the, the, the water and the runoff was going downstream carrying the sewage. Hmm. And it made the people that lived beneath this community sicker. So, you know, you hear that narrative and he talks passionately about illnesses and and the way that we can address these illnesses from a a strategic stance, and and it was called public health. So that lecture and that class and his his fervor around the subject made me interested. So that's kind of where the the impetus to go into public health came from. Wow. You know, after you finished up at Boston University, how did you use that degree or where did you go from there? So first off, going to Boston was a complete culture shock. You know, I'd gone from being around predominantly black people to going to a place where there is so many uh, different, you know, varieties and the diversity is is on a thousand. Boston as a city is a an educational campus. It has like more institutions per square mile than I think anywhere else in the U.S. With that said, or Massachusetts does. With that said, man, I just remember falling in love with uh, social and behavioral sciences uh, I went there and, and pursued um, epidemiology first, and then halfway through, I said, I want to get a second concentration. So I started focusing on social and behavioral sciences because learning how people thought and how they programmed messaging to to reach different communities was important to me. And so I stayed there after graduation and worked as a researcher for two years, literally dealing with patients who had substance use issues and could be candidates for Suboxone treatment to help them with opiate dependence. Uh, so seeing this early is what made like a huge difference. You know, we're talking like 2008, 2009, way before the opiate epidemic. Oh, wow. I was working with a medication to help curb uh, people's appetites for uh, or cravings for this, this drug. Uh, and, and just being in Massachusetts at the turn of, healthcare reform. They were the first place to have like full uh, universal coverage. And that is what Obamacare was built out of. I was right there when this started happening. So all of those things gave me uh, a true north in terms of how I wanted to practice. So when the decision came to look at medicine again, I just, I think I had a, a more clear view of what I wanted to do in healthcare. And then um, as you applied to medical school, I know you hit some, some speed bumps, some roadblocks there. You recently had a video, which was incredible. You dropped that early August that just detailed your applications process. And you were recording it in, in such a way like you knew you were going to make it, but you kept grinding. Talk about that process, man, because that was, I know it was inspiring to me. Yeah, man. So I, I if, if you look at my... Um my Instagram page or my Twitter account, my handle is great vision. And this was a joke that someone said one time because they were talking about how I could read things from very far away because my actual eyesight 
is pretty strong. <laughs> and so they were like, man, boy, got great vision. And so <laughs> it just turned in. <laughs> That's how it came out, right? And I thought about it jokingly. So my first Twitter name was Great Vision. But with that said, like, it actually manifested, and I didn't realize it, that it was happening. So I started to see downstream. I said, you know what? This process of me uh, trying to get into medical school and continuously, like, running into obstacles and not getting accepted, having multiple rounds of rejections, never getting a medical school interview. Like, I wanted to, to capture that. But it wasn't because I knew that one day it would all make sense. It was because... I would have imploded, you know, like these are, these are traumatic experiences and students need to understand that this is, uh, that we need to normalize that. And for me, doing those video diaries was a catharsis. It was a process of saying like, you know what, I can't hold this in because if I do, I'm going to sink deeper into depression. I'm going to tear myself down and I'll never regain or rebuild the confidence that I need to run this entire race. So just started doing those video diaries. And then in a very organic way, things aligned and I was able to uh, get into a post back program. And from there, man, it just, you know, I moved to, to Nashville, uh, literally in a week uh, after finding out wow. uh, with two bags, I still had a whole apartment in Boston that was rent paid for. I moved down to Nashville. I lived in a hotel for about a week. Then I lived at Fisk campus in the dorms for two months and eventually got an, a place, an apartment in Nashville by like September and just worked my tail off every day coming back to this dorm room, you know, living in these four concrete walls during their summer session and just saying, I can't lose this. I can't squander this opportunity. Wow. So uh, all of those things are captured. I have videos for all of that. And now on this end, looking back, I just see, you know, that this is the power of having a dream. This is truly what it means to, to define yourself by your resilience and your ability to endure things. Because to be qu quite honest, this is what our patients deal with. Our patients, they come in Absolutely. door and they say, you're like, why haven't you taken your medication? And they've been going through stuff. And you got to say something to them that's going to make them feel like it's possible. And so when you come from something like this type of a struggle, when you know what it means to, to really, really be at the bottom and to work and claw your way back to a place where you can at least look at yourself in the mirror, that's the narrative that I speak to these patients. And that's why I connect with them. This is going to stay between the two of us, but, but here it is. Great vision, the Italo Brown story. Ooh, man, listen. We're going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna give you your 15. percent Yes, please. 15. Whoa, we're making 35. We got a deal. <laughs> Fair enough. We'll, we'll talk numbers. We'll talk numbers later. <laughs> you come with your number. I'm gonna come with another number. Oh, we'll man. be in the, uh -oh. in the middle. Deal. Man, no, that that is uh, inspiring. And, and the thing about your life is the word that I see portrayed over and over again is service, and that you're kind of driven by your service to others. Man, uh, first off, uh, just hearing you say that is very humbling. Like, I got chills, man, because, you know, we, we are taught often to to continue to look forward, and it's very, se very seldom have I looked back and actually, like, tried to see a unifying thread. And to hear you say that service is a part of that, it means that I was doing something right, and I was actually being a vessel, which is all I've ever wanted to be as a provider. So uh, I would say that that's accurate. I, I define myself and my ability to be of service. And as I've always kind of like alluded to, I come from a family of people who believe strongly in service. My father was uh, in the armed forces. He was an uh, airman. He actually was a firefighter mm -hmm. when he left uh, the Air Force and was a firefighter for 35 years before retiring. So that's a service field. My mom was a high school teacher. She taught high school English for, a, I would probably say, 20 some odd years, which is a service uh, and, and one that you often go and, and do thanklessly. So mm -hmm. that is what my DNA consists of. So it's natural for me to want to fall in alignment with those things. That is uh, it's, it's such an incredible thread in your life because 
after the MPH, after medical school, after residency, you went out west for a fellowship in social emergency medicine. Now, now, when I first, I remember, because uh, I remember meeting you briefly at SNMA mm-hmm. conference. I can't remember which one it was. Then I saw you're going to social emergency medicine. I said, this dude is doing a fellowship in Instagram and Facebook. <laughs> and I was like, the, the, the ER folks would do a, a, a doggone fellowship in, in social media, but it is social emergency medicine. Tell us about that. You know, you're not the first person that said that. Uh, multiple folks will see my presences on social media and platforms, and they be like, dog, how did you get them to, okay, you doing a whole fellowship in tweets and 140 character sound bites, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I think the, the first thing I got to say is we've been seeing social medicine for a number of years. It's just now finally becoming something that is um, unavoidable and that other people are catching up in terms of like respecting it. So social emergency medicine basically is when you're looking at health disparities and all of the different ways that those social determinants of health manifest in context of emergency care delivery or the the delivery of emergency services. So I usually give people like a, a broad stroke picture, like, all right, we know that people who have kidney failure need dialysis. They need it to live. So if they know they needed to live, why do people miss dialysis? And when you really Mm -hmm. break it down, it's not just laziness. It's not just, I didn't have a ride because those things have already been addressed. You know, they have entire vans that come and pick people up. DaVita has vans that come to the house and take you to dialysis and take you back home. And it's paid for by the federal government. So why do people still miss dialysis? And when you start looking at those social factors, that's when the real tale of the tape is exposed. Imagine having a grandparent who goes on dialysis and needs her blood literally, you know, filtered to live, but her daughter Mm -hmm. is addicted to drugs or happens to be lost in the street somewhere, you know, doing, living a life. And she has to take care of this woman's uh, four-year-old child, her grandson or granddaughter. Mm -hmm. And she has to make a choice between going to get dialysis or watching this four-year-old kid. She's going to choose a four-year-old kid all the time, even at her own detriment. So these are reasons why people miss dialysis. Folks who have no home, have nowhere to go, living on the streets in tent communities, missing dialysis. You know, when you have to make a decision, and then there's even just like apathy. So I know 35, 40-year-old black men who have uncontrolled high blood pressure issues put on dialysis and they say, what's the use of me going to dialysis? It's more likely that I'm going to get shot living in the streets of Richmond or Oakland. So these are the reasons why social emergency medicine exists to analyze those relationships and to try to come up with solutions or propose ideas that can kind of intervene here and and hopefully save more lives. And that's incredible the way you you, uh, broke that down because these are the things that we know exist, but we don't necessarily discuss them. Medical- Never discuss them, man. I mean, it's, 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 here's the part that, that's crazy, right? Most folks who come from communities that are underserved or who are underrepresented minorities in medicine have seen this, have lived this, have been around this mm-hmm. stuff, but it's not valued the same way that we would value somebody who has done a study abroad program or who has a second right. language that they mastered or who worked in the Peace Corps. Like, for some reason, we elevate those experiences and we totally overlook these lived experiences of people who understand something that is so fundamentally important to the way that we deliver care. I'm going to ask you a scenario. I think it's going to trigger you a little Uh bit. You're You're in the ER, you're seeing a patient, and some trainee is giving you a sign out, and they label this person as non-compliant. How would you break that word down? What would you say? Well, the first thing is I correct them. First, I'd say the proper term that we've used and have been using in healthcare for a number of years is actually not adherent, non-adherent, not non-compliant, because non-compliant has a negative connotation to it. Non-compliant means that they are potentially like electing to do this in a way that is almost uh, either combative or clearly oppositional. And I don't think that that's fair. The second thing is Mm -hmm. you have to break down what that even means. Like, why are they non-adherent? 
it's not as simple as just saying like, and I told them to take these, uh, you know, their blood pressure medications. They just choose not to. Like, why are mm-hmm. they not taking these blood pressure meds? Have you figured out if they can access these medications? Do you know if someone has, in the language that they speak, interpreted to them the importance of the medications and how to take them properly? Do they have the money to pick up this? Are they choosing between paying rent and paying for blood pressure meds? You know what I mean? Or eating and picking up blood pressure meds. If you don't know this, then you can't sit there and call them non-adherent. You have to address these issues at the core. And part of that means that as a physician, you got to ask better questions. Absolutely, man. If anybody takes anything away from this episode, I, I hope it, I mean, that is case in point in a nutshell. Something we should all take away. I appreciate that. Um, to that end, you're involved in a nonprofit organization. Yes. Sir. Tell us a little bit about that. So <clears throat> back to those Morehouse days, uh, my first week in Morehouse, as I said, I was 17 years old, uh, stepping on the foot of Morehouse College. It was hot as hell. Uh, I literally remember the extreme humidity. And in California, <laughs> you know, we're used to sun, just sun, not associated humidity, like warmth, heat on my neck, but not like sweltering jungle heat. And I remember talking to this brother in the first week who was from Oakland, California. His name was Jamil Lacey. And we were talking about how hot it was and we couldn't stand it. And then we started talking about like things the way, the way they were back home. And we really connected over that. Ended up becoming a lifelong friend. Now, in about 2014, he had gone through a bunch of different phases of his career and decided that he wanted to start doing something in healthcare. He said, Talo, I'm thinking about doing this thing where we go into barbershops and we just approach black men and boys to talk about their health issues. We can do some screenings. We can do like HIV stuff. We can do uh, mental health and depression stuff. And we can really connect, connect them with source resources. And I want to call this trap medicine. What do you think? And I was like, dog, that is catchy. It, it explains exactly what we're talking about. Because when you think about what trap means in hip hop culture or in, in, in the black culture in general, like trap music, we understand that it means coming from something that is of struggle. But it also talks about the idea of snaring something and capturing it. And if we're not getting the medicine from the places that are supposed to be designed for us to get it, but truly aren't, then we have to trap that medicine somewhere else. And if we're going to trap it, let's trap it in mm-hmm. these community safe spaces. So it made so much more sense. And it became an acronym after that. With that, I will say my experience has been literally one of the most empowering things to be able to hold service with community members and just talk to young black men and boys about health issues in a space that they would consider neutral and endearing. And I just, I've seen the transformation. In fact, barbershop-based health interventions are becoming a standard as far as trying to get health messaging and improve health literacy, particularly around the chronic illnesses that Black men face. So what has that organization grown into? Where is it located? So initially started out in Oakland, California. uh, And basically, the four folks who have kind of been the advisory board members have all been scattered in different places throughout California. Right now, most of our actions are happening in Los Angeles, right there, South Central LA. And we have been partnering with different organizations. We partnered with UCLA. We partnered with Kaiser. Uh, we up here, up top, we partner with Stanford. We look at major institutions to be partners in this stuff to help drive the uh, the research elements and create data to essentially push funding so that you can do more robust studies and more robust community outreach and work. Um, the most recent stuff that we've been focusing on is the 100 Block Initiative, where we are trying to provide COVID education and testing to a diff- like 100 blocks in South Central LA. And, you know, we've, we've been doing the fundraising for this. My man, Jamil Lacey, is on the ground literally every day trying to solve this with the resources of the Department of Health down in LA. So, you know, just just continue to watch how we're working on this issue. And as we uh, we see COVID become not just a, a, a an unavoidable issue, as we see it become something that 
the black community is being decimated by, know that there are organizations that are taking, uh, picking up the mantle in addressing this. Absolutely. How can folks get involved? How can they find out more about this organization? How can they help? Sure. So you can always hit us up at uh, www.trapmedicine.org. We're also on social media, on Instagram. Just go to Trap Medicine. And if you look up me at, at Great Vision, I will always be posting articles or trying to amplify the work of other nonprofits as well as Trap Medicine with respect to uh, doing anything health oriented. And right now, COVID is the top on the list. So as we wrap up, you've been involved in some pretty cool projects. A couple of videos that have just gone viral. (laughs) You worked with GQ Magazine. Tell us about that. How did that partnership come to be? And how much fun was it working with an organization that large? Yeah, man. Major shout out to uh, the family over at uh, Gentleman's Quarterly, GQ. (laughs) Uh, They basically have a series called The Breakdown. And they bring different experts on to talk about films, like movies, that have scenes that people have watched and say, you know what, what is the accuracy of this scene? So you might have a, a rock climber, a professional um, you know, climber break down a rock climbing scene in a movie. So they said, we want to look at movie injuries and see how realistic they are. So somehow, I don't know whose LinkedIn I was attached to, they found me and I interviewed and they were like, hey, we like you and wanted me to break down some movies. I showed up on the set I'm saying they said some movies. They ended up having me break down like 10 movies. And <laughs> I was like, wait a minute now. You said some, I'm thinking three. <laughs> it turned into this long thing now. And the, the funniest part about it is one day of recording, we probably did about three hours straight of filming. And it was a, a very comfortable conversation. I brought my college roommate. I brought one of my other college friends. And, you know, to keep me from being nervous, I just talked to them. And I acted as though we were sitting on a couch watching, uh, you know, Scarface, watching Kill Bill, watching us, watching all these movies with action scenes. And I talked about those movies, how I would talk about anything else. The downside, the upside was it ended up getting over five and a half million views. And uh, people love the fact that they see a black doctor who can speak confidently Mm -hmm. about injuries and how they present in the emergency department and what we would do to uh, address those issues. The downside is now my friends don't want to see any action movies with me. (laughs) (laughs) Nobody wanted to see Bad Boys uh, 3 with me. I was like, come on, y'all. Pre-COVID, I couldn't get anyone to come through and watch a single action movie because they were like, one, he's going to he'll have all the spoiler alerts that are not given and he's going to ruin it for us. We won't believe anything that happens in the movie anymore. No, I mean, everybody's done this. If you've watched a movie, you're in medicine, you're interested in it, you've mm-hmm. thought about the uh, real, whether or not this was a realistic injury. And the cool part about being an ER physician is you've seen a lot of this, so you know how it plays out. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Brown, thank you so much for coming on the show and just dropping knowledge bomb after knowledge bomb. Tell us again how folks can find you on social media and follow your progress. So, Stephen, I just want to say thank you, bro, for having me on here. Like, I truly respect you. I think that you are a a, a shining star uh, and continue to carry that light and candle forward. Uh, You can reach me for the the people who are listening at at Great Vision uh, on Instagram or on Twitter. Um, Italo Brown on LinkedIn. Or you can check the hashtag RMRN. We'll be literally linked to that as brothers and and continue to follow that or follow hashtag in the disparity. Dr. Brown, man, I can't thank you enough. Go follow this guy on social media. Everything he posts is solid information. My favorite thing about your uh, your Instagram is when you post your stories with the music, the music's always on point. Oh man, it's curated. I think through it, I'm like, I gotta make sure that the tunes is right. Every every superhero needs a soundtrack. That's what they said. In, uh, I'm gonna get you something. <laughs> Awesome, man. And the culture is blessed to have you. I know you're going to do some even bigger things down the road. Man, we're going to push together. The Black Doctors Podcast is a nonprofit volunteer passion project with the goal of inspiring all who listen. Tune in next week for another episode of the Black Doctors Podcast with Dr. Stephen Bradley, your friendly neighborhood anesthesiologist.